What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 229 at block height 640,032 on Monday, July 20th. Well, what's cracking today, Janine? Well, I have had a very exciting weekend, and by exciting, I mean that uh, a fundamental aspect of one of my laptops broke. And I subsequently found out that it was poorly designed and they also knew about it January 2019 at the latest. So yeah, I've had a great weekend trying to discover what mistakes people have made and the fact that they're not even selling the version of the device that I had. Yeah, it's uh, shitty to say the least. You would, uh, you would think that, you know, a hinge on a laptop might, uh, might not be good when it's screwed into plastic. You know, that might not be a smart idea, but apparently that is something that escaped some people. Yeah, I mean, product engineering, as far as those little things, is... A difficult thing, but yeah, that's something that has decades of prior experience to learn from. Yep. So aside from your adventures and trials, though, uh, has also been overall a pretty interesting weekend. It has, uh, because basically the day before I experienced the troubles, um... Yeah, Twitter got hacked. And for some people, it was not very funny. For others of us, it was mildly entertaining. Yeah, there there is a lot of weird aspects of this. Um, Should we? Do you want me to go through like the basic breakdown of at least what Twitter says happened? Yeah, I, th I think that'd be a good place to start because I'm. Uh, trying yeah i'm kind of out of blank as far as like the the things i want to point at and go this doesn't really add up yeah so a couple days ago um basically a lot of you if you're on crypto or bitcoin twitter you may have noticed that a bunch of accounts particularly verified accounts were tweeting out messages that were saying basically give to this address or we'll double your i, I don't think that did any of them actually say double your bitcoin or was that just kind of the assumption no they they, they did it people fell for it yeah, so more double your Bitcoin scamming stuff happening, although this one was very interesting because it was coming from a bunch of different accounts that were verified and, uh, you know, tied to people that you wouldn't think be doing this. And it turned out that actually Twitter itself had come under attack and the uh, decision of the people who were performing the attack, um, regardless of how maybe... It was otherwise more complicated, but their main uh, method of basically profiting or, you know, getting something out of the fact that they were able to perform this attack is that they basically did a double your Bitcoin scam and tweeted out a bunch of Bitcoin addresses. But um, to go into some of the basics of uh, what Twitter says happened, um, which, you know, when this all was going down, people were saying, well, maybe it was a social media management site that was compromised that all of these accounts happened to be using, which is not impossible. Um, 
maybe uh, you know there's a bunch of different theories but it became very clear given the, the volume of accounts that had been compromised that that was probably an unlikely scenario and that it was more likely to be going through twitter's own system itself and so in twitter's report that i think they published on the 18th uh, i believe um in the what happens section they say at this time, we believe attackers targeted certain Twitter employees through a social engineering scheme. What does this mean? In this context, social engineering is the intentional manipulation of people into performing certain actions and divulging confidential information. The attackers successfully manipulated a small number of employees and used their credentials to access Twitter's internal systems, including getting through our two-factor protections. Um, well... It would depend, uh, not, they kind of didn't clarify whether they mean like user two factor protections or Twitter's two factor protections because I can, like, everyone knows that, you know, unless you've designed your system in a very specific way where users actually have control of their data, having two factor on your account in general does not mean that your account can't be, comp can't be compromised by an insider attack. It just means that someone can't take over your account through you know your specific account without going through the internal system so it's a bit unclear what they mean there i'm assuming they mean user two-factor protections um because having two-factor protections from employees that are being socially engineered is kind of pointless because they'll just use them um, they say, as of now, we know that they access tools only available to our internal support teams to target 130 Twitter accounts. For 45 of those accounts, the attackers are able to initiate a password reset, log into the account, and send tweets. We are continuing our forensic review of all the accounts to confirm all actions that may have been taken. In addition, we believe they may have attempted to sell some of the usernames. Um, something important to mention here is that I think they've since said that they do not believe that, um that passwords themselves um, were being accessed outside of obviously the password reset process. They, they didn't actually compromise the, the stored passwords that Twitter has as far as they know. Um, and I don't, I think they've also said they, they haven't seen anything to suggest that they went after DMS. Do you know if that's changed? Um, yeah, they, they actually updated, um, and said that eight accounts um, had all of their, their DM and their complete Twitter history data set extracted. But yeah. they're claiming that all eight of those accounts, um, none of them were verified accounts. So I think they're, they're trying okay. to get at like it wasn't Obama or Biden or, or Musk who had their uh, data compromised like that. Okay, yeah. So... I mean, the, the key point there, though, is that they were able to access people's DMs and what, regardless of whether they actually, whether Twitter actually found evidence that they, they attempted to access them and did access them. The point is they were able to access them and they could have accessed the DMs of more people. And, you know, yes, DMs are terrible. They're not encrypted. They're not private. Like, bas basically... When you use Twitter DMs, you should basically assume that they're only safe. They're only safe maybe from other Twitter users. They're not safe from Twitter. They're not safe from anyone who compromises either your account or the other person's account. I mean, they can see all the DMs. So in general, if you're using DMs to talk about something privately, especially something really sensitive that you wouldn't want to get out, do not use Twitter DMs. That's stupid. Use something else. But yeah, so in conclusion for the what happened section, they say, uh, yeah, for up to eight of the Twitter accounts involved, the attackers took the additional step of downloading the account's information through your Twitter data tool. Um, this is a tool meant to provide an account owner with a summary of their Twitter account details and activity. We are reaching out directly to an account, any account owner where we know this to be true. None of the eight accounts were verified. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what they've said in their report. Um, yeah, well, and the, the the weird thing is, is that I've tried a number of times to use the the download your Twitter data tool, and I think I've tried it three times in the entire time that I've had a Twitter account, and it's only ever worked once. They, like, the other two times, they just, I don't know what happened, they just forgot about it, it just didn't get triggered, I didn't get anything. 
Um, and then the way that they send it to you is kind of like you need to know how to actually parse that information to be able to view it correctly unless you just want to comb through you know a lot what it was what is often a lot of gerbled uh nonsense so for a lot of people that data isn't even useful unless you know how to actually um organize it but yeah so the fact that people were able to use that tool um i mean and th think about it this is the thing that any Twitter support employee could do, regardless of whether they're using this power maliciously. So you should always assume that at any point, a, someone who has these kinds of credentials at Twitter could could be doing this to your account. They could get everything. So you should be aware at all times of like what kinds of information you're putting out on Twitter and how sensitive it is. Yeah, that that was definitely something that struck me as weird because I have tried to to get my data set multiple times too, and I've never actually got it. And yeah. from my understanding, they usually take weeks to mm -hmm. actually get that to any user who requests it. So, um, yeah, that that's really odd to me. If they were <clears throat> the attackers were actually able to to get that data delivered. Like, was that fast-tracked through the administrator tools or something? Because otherwise, um, that that just is not how that works in my experience. Yeah, I mean, it must it must have been fast-tracked. Fast I don't remember precisely how long it took when I finally did get mine that one time, but it was at least a couple of days. So I'm assuming that they were able to get it because they had access to whatever this internal uh support system wasn't that maybe fast tracked it um because otherwise i'm kind of surprised that they were able to do that um because i wasn't able to do that um yeah mm -hmm. and then as usual um one of the first articles to well detailed articles to come out about this was from motherboard because um um, Joseph Cox tends to, uh, in communication with, uh, these types of attackers very quickly, um, for a number of different data breaches in different, uh, companies. And so, um, I think he was able to talk to them and they, assuming they are who they say they are, they, you know, said that they basically paid off these Twitter employees, um, and it's kind of, I'm kind of wondering, because I, I don't remember if the article said whether they were going to pay them in the Bitcoin that they were going to make from the double your Bitcoin scam, or they they had just paid them off in advance in fiat, um, or if they were going to have a share of the Bitcoin, who knows. But yeah, um, I mean, my favorite tweet from this whole thing was someone saying like, you know, if you, if you think this is bad, um, there's like... 10 to $15 an hour employees who are working at your telecom, uh, you know, who have massive amounts of uh, power over your mobile phone and being able to transfer ownership of that SIM card to someone else. And uh, they get socially engineered all the time because they're not getting paid very much and phone networks suck. And, you know, a couple hundred dollars at most is sometimes enough to tempt them to just give your sim card to someone else and you can get screwed and there's people who have lost bitcoin from that type of thing and so twitter needs to take this more seriously in terms of preventative measures on the user side so that even if they don't fix things in terms of their ability to hire honest people who wouldn't succumb to this um for example, people should have the ability to wipe their DMs, you know, not not even asking for encrypting DMs because that is w apparently way too much to ask. How about you just let people delete their DMs? Because at the moment, um, in case anyone doesn't know this, when you uh, when you delete a DM, it's deleted on your end, but the other account that you are DMing to, it doesn't disappear for them. They have to delete it also themselves, um, and that. That seems like a really stupid system to me like unless you're trying to build twitter in a way that's like oh forensic evidence that you're not you don't want dms to be deleted so that you have an accurate history it's like i 
that sounds stupid to me. So just please let people delete their DMs and that would solve a lot of, I think, the worry that some people had about their accounts being potentially accessed by these attackers. Also, it might be a good idea to have some kind of rate limiting, um, as you already do with Twitter accounts. You know, a person can't just tweet a whole bunch of, like, hundreds of tweets. They can't do that in a short period of time without getting rate limited. You'll get a warning from Twitter. So how about you do that also for... Uh, even if you have a support employee, um, they should not be able to just tweet from someone else's account just like that and not get some kind of rate limiting. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the kind of take on things in motherboard isn't the only one either. Um, Nathaniel Popper and Kate Conger, uh, posted something on the 17th in the New York times that claimed to be a direct interview with some of the people involved. And um, their take on it is that rather than an employee being bribed, um, the person who initially set this off um, was supposedly able to get into an internal slack of Twitter's um, and they found the access to the employee um, admin panel and the credentials there. And this, oh, God. this is just, you know, aside from the, the huge security fuck up there, um, this story just gets weird in the overall dynamics of it. So there were three people, um, one going by the name of Kirk, another LOL, and um, the third was, what was his name? Um, I'll find that in a second, but, um, ever so anxious, but the, the gist of things was apparently, um, Kirk got into their internal slack and found access to this and advertised that on a discord server, um, where he pretty much started selling access to different accounts, like, uh, with very short usernames and things like that, because, uh, you know, immature hackers like this uh, love getting things like that as uh, social points. Um, and pretty much um, it's a really in-depth timetable um, through the day when this initially started. And they just started going for accounts like at Y or at six, um, you know, typical nonsense targets like that. And then started moving into crypto accounts. And there's pretty much a hard delineation here um, where LOL and Ever So Anxious, who early on were very active in assisting Kirk to find buyers for accounts that he compromised, um, just kind of disconnected and um, stopped being involved as Kirk um, started hitting the more major accounts like Kanye West, uh, Obama, Biden, um, Elon Musk. And effectively, um, he kind of carried that off on his own until the entire thing wound to an end. And the thing that really is just odd to me here is how um, LOL, ever so anxious, um, and even some people who apparently bought compromised accounts, um, all of them were willing to talk to people from the New York Times and go on record about this. But Kirk, um, the actual originator of the attack, um, just vanished and stopped responding to anybody on any platform. Um, you know, when, when the attack wound down and Twitter kind of locked things down again. So at the very least, um, that shows much more intelligence um, <laughs> than the people who talk to the New York Times. But what's kind of weird to me about this is why. Um, why is the original um, source of this attack um, that much more mature, locked down, discreet? Um, and why was this done in such a way where all of these uh, clueless morons were used as kind of a shield as far as the origin of this exploit? Um, because now all the publicity 
all the attention is going to shift to the all these people who talked to the media. Um, and Kirk is just going to be Kirk on Discord um, that nothing else has ever learned about. And that to me is just – that is why – um, despite all of the other aspects of this, I find it really hard to dismiss the idea of a more coordinated group than just random kids on the internet because his involvement seems very tactically thought through. Um, and all of these other people are effectively now a, a shield as far as drawing attention and, and, you know, any efforts to really do something about this in the follow up. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't rule it out because you you know with the Ross Ulbricht case, you had one of the DEA agents investigating it. You know, he stole he stole Bitcoin from the Silk Road, and then he you know tried to try. I, I think he actually went to some exchange or something and tried to actually convert it to fiat, and he was unsuccessful. Um, as far as I know, as far as I remember. So I would not put it past a state actor who is either, you know, he, he may not be operating in like on behalf of the state, like it might not be an actual operation, um, in which case he's just gone rogue and he just has maybe special access like uh, the DEA had, the DEA agent had through the investigation. Um, but if it is anything bigger than that, like it's actually a state sanctioned operation, then that would be interesting because, you know, considering the types of accounts that were targeted, um, maybe it was just a big info grab about influential people in at least influential in the social aspect of the space. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know. I really don't think we're going to get a uh, a clear-cut answer here as far as what actually happened. Um, <laughs> I think this is just going to be a case of narratives, um, and all we're going to really get is the different ones to choose from. Yeah, and just to clarify one thing, um, in the same report that Twitter has put out, uh, where they list off what the attackers access, they say attackers were not able to view previous account passwords. Um, attackers were able to view personal information, including email addresses and phone numbers, which are displayed to some users of our internal support tools. The, re the reason that would be important to know is some people may be like, oh, it's just my email address, my phone number. But if your phone number that's associated because unfortunately twitter now kind of forces people to um associate a phone number with their account even if they're i think i think even if you're not using sms 2fa anymore which you shouldn't be using i think they still force you to have a, a phone number linked with your twitter account unless you created the twitter account before um i think 2016 sometime because I, all, my Twitter accounts were all created before then, and I've never been forced to associate a phone, which, thank God, because I don't have one to associate. But um, anyway, so for people who may look at that and be like, well, it's just my email address, it's just my phone number, why is that a big deal? Um, and I would say that if your phone number and your email address aren't, if, if they're not public, and you're you're already you're you're assuming that most people don't know them, or you're okay, or oppositely, you're you're okay with people knowing them. You might want to be careful because they might take that information and assume that you know if your Twitter account is um, associated with this email address, that's probably one of your it's probably one of your most important email addresses, depending on how. Um, how influential your Twitter account is, which in this case, a lot of them were verified accounts and had a significant following. So that would probably be valuable. And so it would not surprise me if there was maybe a secondary wave of attacks against the email addresses and also the phone numbers. There might be SIM swaps against the phone numbers that were associated with the Twitter accounts. So I would suggest that if you can, you should probably change the phone number associated with your Twitter account so that, uh, and also so disassociate that phone number from any important accounts because if the if there is a secondary wave of attacks based on that information you don't want to risk losing any other accounts because 
you know, these guys were able to do a SIM swap on your phone, which is not as hard as you think it is, especially if you're in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the one last thing on the list is um, in cases where an account was taken over by the attacker, they may have been able to view additional information. Our forensic investigation is ongoing. Okay, so that wasn't any other. They're still looking into it, basically. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the actual Bitcoin raised by that side of things, um, there's something like $180,000 worth of coins. And a little little funny note, <clears throat> um, some Monero trolls were sending money to that address um, with dust outputs to um, pr pretty much vanity addresses that there is no computational way anybody could have the private key um, to, um, saying things like, uh, why not use Monero? Um, you screwed up using Bitcoin. And just silly trolley um, messages like that in the addresses. But, um, <clears throat> you know, so far, um, it looks like I think around two um, Bitcoin and some change from this was actually funneled through Wasabi. And apparently one of the accounts involved in the whole cluster of transactions is a Coinbase account, um, according to Samurai's analysis, um, who have you know, I'll get into this in the next one, conveniently been throwing around the um, whole narrative that a user making stupid post-mix choices equals the mixing protocol being broken. But um, so yeah, um, whoever is actually in control of those coins um, is very likely fucked right now because if that's tied to a Coinbase account, um, that's tied to his identity and yeah um he fucked up from square one yeah and one uh disclaimer um, um yes the report amount is 180,000 so far and i think for the most part there was a significant amount of money that probably came from actual people who got tricked people are they do get tricked by these kinds of scams but it's also important to remember that um, the attackers have an incentive to send themselves money to make it look like they're getting more money than they actually are so that people look at it and be like, oh, well, there is money going here. What if I miss out? And so it kind of gets pe it gets more people to send money when they send the money to themselves. So that mm -hmm. number might not be entirely accurate, but there probably, there probably is going to be a, large, a significant number of people who probably did send money to this because there always are mm -hmm. all righty i guess uh i want to move spruce, along no admins. <laughs> all right though i'm gonna jump ahead to the next one and just get through this short and sweet because frankly um the exact type of nonsensical drama that i thought this would entail um is what happened but pretty much um, back in June, um, around June 12th, I was approached by a samurai user through somebody um, whose wallet had been experiencing address reuse um, through no intent or conscious action of their own. And I started digging into that. So pretty much... Um, I pulled um, with nothing much um, the dumpling data set um, that Wasabi had constructed to analyze coin joins on the blockchain, um, just as a convenient data set that was already constructed. And first started looking through to see if this issue was larger than the single user who approached me. Um, now, we screwed up here, and uh, this is something that Samurai and their disclosure um, went through pretty thoroughly. Um, our original count of address reuse was 5,113 addresses, and that was a failure to um, parse through the data set pretty much and remove um, double counts. So pretty much what happened was um, a script was present in an input um, when it was spent 
as well as an output in the previous transaction um, that created it. And, you know, we kind of screwed up and forgot to <clears throat> remove that from the data set. So the actual number of address reuses was 441, if I remember correctly. But <clears throat> in the case of the, the user who approached me, I was able to confirm that every instance of address reuse was always the zero index down his change derivation path. And so pretty much um, digging through stuff, we found out that um, <clears throat> the Android wallet uh, Samurai client does not persist locally um, the index value down derivation paths. Um, it just is fed that every time the wallet opens from the back end. And most importantly, um, there are no error handling or, or safety checks or anything on that data structure that's fed by the back end. So any type of network disruption, um, any type of connectivity issue during the process of the wallet fetching that, um, it would pretty much just throw something in the debug log and then remain at the zero index, which is why the address reuse was happening. So th this is pretty much the same kind of bug um, that happened with blockchain info, fetching entropy from random.org um, and not sanitizing or checking what it's actually receiving back that led to people generating the same addresses and losing money. Now, thankfully, the issue here has nothing to do with anything that could actually result in people losing money or any type of entropy failure. It was just the index value for which change address to use next. But given that this is a privacy focused wallet, um, you know, that is a major issue. Um, that should not under any circumstances be happening. And so pretty much um, their patch for this was to add a secondary filter um, to the back end, um, both their back end and Dojo, um, to check a transaction for address reuse before it actually broadcasts it. Now, this is a, a patch that works if you broadcast your transactions through their backend or through your Dojo instance. But given that the entire wallet is set up to make it very easy to um, pull transactions off, collaborate on them and broadcast them through arbitrary means, um, you can literally set the wallet to not broadcast transactions so that you can do that by default. Um, that's something that users should consider. And I think that despite how much of a fringe issue that could wind up being, um, that's still a very dangerous thing because the root issue of the client not persisting and running its own local safety checks on that derivation path index value um, still leaves this open. That This could still happen. And I think given the nature of the wallet as something specifically set up to let users take a transaction and broadcast it through arbitrary methods that are not going to have this extra filter on the back end um, checking for reuse before broadcasting it it should still be patched at the local level um but yeah pretty much um you know samurai's disclosure was dropped on the 14th of this month and mine was released uh the day after and uh yeah um as far as that goes um this is pretty much the last time I'm going to touch on this because exactly like I thought would happen but hoped wouldn't, um, this has just become a giant drama cesspit instead of just acknowledging a bug, um, fixing it, and moving on, which is kind of sad in my opinion. Yeah, and um, I think there was also there was something that they reported incorrectly in their discourse which is they were saying transactions i think they said addresses or what 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 was it there was something that they they said one thing at the beginning of the report and then it was different yeah that, the that, end. That, that was a little um 
don't know that I will give them the benefit of the doubt on that that was just a terminology screw up. But in my disclosure to them, I specifically cited um, address or script reuse um, with the count I initially gave them, and they um, talked about that count in terms of transactions um, and not the addresses that were reused. But you know that that little detail I'm willing to extend a slight benefit of the doubt but yeah overall I think well, that their entire disclosure was framed to downplay the issue not act it didn't actually even mention the specific mechanism causing this bug and then like I said um they rather than fixing the issue at the core have just added a new filter on the back end that still leaves users vulnerable potentially who would broadcast transactions elsewhere yeah i mean i wasn't trying to say that they they misreported that intentionally but that was that was an error and yeah um because i mean anyone who actually reads if you read through the report um you don't get the impression that the like the cause of that address re the, the, the cause of the address reuse is not mentioned anywhere and that that in general is just a strange thing to do like normally in these types of investigations you would actually say like what was the cause of this problem like sure you identified the scope of the problem and yes the scope of the problem was actually a lot smaller than was reported but where where is the investigation into the cause and that was not mentioned in their disclosure and that just seems weird to me it's like if they disagree with the cause or maybe the cause um was something else then they should say that um i don't know why they didn't or maybe they haven't identified it yet but they didn't say that so i just found it weird that they didn't identify what they thought the cause was in their report but they did say multiple times um in their disclosure that yes this this is address reuse there is instances of in intentional and unintentional address reuse and any address reuse is is not something that should be tolerated and they did do something to fix it, but I I agree that the fix didn't... Because yes, they did propose a fix, but the fact that they didn't even mention what the cause was, it's like, how do you know... How, how are you showing people that the fix that you made actually addresses the problem? Because wouldn't it better to be... Wouldn't it be better to fix the root of the, the problem instead of I implementing a filter? Um, but yeah, I... I f and I think on Twitter somewhere, I don't remember who said it, but one of them said that like the fact that the amount of re address reuse was overestimated was like a DDoS attack. It's like, guys, really? Like, <laughs> like you, there are tools out there, like, yes, in this case, the script didn't function well, but this, you, <laughs> it's not a DDoS attack for someone to point out the fact that yes your privacy wallet was engaging in address reuse unintentionally and that's a problem and it was overestimated but it's still happening that's not a ddos attack um it's kind of like how the uh what was it it was kind of like how the term otr was being misused that i pointed out um several episodes back like don't don't use this terminology lightly and don't don't misuse it because the people who just want to share these privacy tools with others and don't want to get them drowned in the drama that goes on on Twitter, um, this is all just the, the constant snitching back and forth is just getting to us, and we don't we don't want to look at it. And honestly, I've stopped I've stopped caring. Outside of the point, out, like the only part where I care is when certain people indicate incompetence about issues that actually matter, like what OTR is, and the difference between OTR technically and OTR socially. They are different, <laughs> and if you don't demonstrate that you understand that, that can be extremely troubling to people who actually understand what that means and understand the consequences of not understanding what that means. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> really, that it's like from my point of view, it's just sad because I mean, really, I had every reason to just dump that out there publicly and then just wipe my hands off and walk away and i didn't because i thought that was irresponsible and regardless 
of my issues with samurai um they're not the ones being affected by this it's their users and i just think it's really kind of sad that somebody who memes all day on twitter about people on the streets and, and actual users that when confronted with a, a very serious issue that negatively impacted their users privacy um they spend more time downplaying it than actually thinking about the consequences for their users r regardless of the scope of how many people are affected but yeah you ready to put a lid on this one Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think it's important for us to say because some people um, intentionally or not have put out some misinformation about our relationship to either Nopara and or Wasabi. And just to be clear, um, as I will include in the newsletter that mentions this disclosure, um, neither of us have any affiliation with Wasabi or ZK Snacks, the company, our only relationship with what you could call relationship is the fact that Shinobi and I did a what is currently a two video series called ZK Snacks back in, I think, 2018. And um, we were, I don't think we were ever told until basically the launch day, but no para and or someone at ZK Snacks um, before it was ZK Snacks, decided to name the company that. Um, and I believe Nopara has said that that's where the name came from. So that's our only relationship to Wasabi slash ZK Snacks. And then uh, Nopara was a co-host. Um, I don't remember the precise in my head right now. It's going to be in the newsletter. But Nopara was a co-host on Block Digest for um, like a year and a half to two years, something like that. I think it was like a year and a half. Um, but like, we don't have, uh, we don't have a financial relationship with them. We never got money from them. We're, we're just friends of his host, but I don't see what that has to do with this because it's not like we're trying to hide it. Everyone knows that he was a co-host for a certain period of time, but he's not currently a co-host. Yeah, that was kind of interesting, um, especially given the fact that I have literally gotten into shouting matches um, with Nopara on the Digest, pushing we, back when I felt his criticism of Samurai went into an illegitimate territory. Yeah, so that, that was interesting. Yeah, literally, there. I don't know if I... I, I, don't, I mean, I have yelled at him in DMs, but... Yeah, I we've gotten into shouting matches with Nopara in defense of Samurai. So anyone who wants and I some of that was off air and some of that was on air. So anyone wa who wants to claim that we have like a bias against Sam it's like it's just ridiculous if you actually look back at our coverage like you can claim some of it wasn't accurate but to say that we're doing it on behalf of Wasabi doesn't make any sense the fact that some people think that really saddens me because i have in in a lot of ways i, I have deliberately distanced myself from both of these projects or getting involved in them because i do not mm -hmm. want to become a football between the two of them i i i just like i i have distanced myself on purpose because these people cannot get their shit together and just be civil so that's the consequence of all of this is that I've actually distanced myself despite the fact that there was barely anything there to begin with. Um, but that's the consequence. So just realize that, you know, you're making these claims about us being, being biased and doing, saying stuff on behalf of other people and you don't realize how much we've actually fought internally with each other to make sure that no, we're actually we're trying to be as accurate as possible. If we do get it wrong, it's not because we're it's not because we're being paid off. And it's really insulting to hear that, given the fact that we've literally yelled at each other on air. <laughs> mm-hmm. Alrighty though. I think uh that will do as a lid and we can get into some more positive news. Yep. So this is really awesome. Um Jack Ballers um, and Zap 
have announced a 3.5 million seed round um, from investors, including Morgan Creek Digital and CMT Digital. And this is going to give them a lot of runway to really start expanding and hiring new people, um, especially given that they now have um, Strike operational in addition to Zap. And they're working on um, their partnership with Visa to hook a card up to uh, the Strike application. So, you know, this this is just really awesome. And I think that Jack, um, in taking this money, um, there's no way he would have done this without uh, the terms kind of allowing him to maintain that autonomy um, that he prizes and things and really continue to build this company and its services out in the way that he wants to. And I really just think it's, it's like, you know, in his post, uh, like talking about this, like, this is fucking awesome. I mean, like three years ago, he literally started zap, um, just hacking away in his mom's basement. And now it is actually a major company, um, partnering with, you know, groups like Visa um, with two major applications out there that kind of balance both sides of things. People who want to use Bitcoin in a totally self-sovereign way and people who just want it as a cheap, easy payment rail and don't really care about the rest of that. And, you know, this is just a fucking awesome thing to see. Like somebody really build up a massive company around lightning so quickly and from so little and to really not hit major stumbling blocks along the way you know like this is i i really think that jack is going to be one of those guys in 10 or 20 years people look back on and that's one of the names that people still remember yes suit man lawyer guy will become a bitcoin urban legend suit man lawyer guys everywhere should be crying and then also um another piece of good news uh zap just dropped a new uh release on the 13th that really dropped a whole fuck ton of new fun stuff um it's running on lnd um 0.10.2 now um it has payment probing so you can actually kind of poke through the network um, preemptively to see the odds of a payment succeeding. Um, multi-path payments, um, so you can break your, your stuff up and not be limited to a single channel route. Um, key send payments, so you can send money without an invoice. Tor support. Um, LNURL support um, for inbound liquidity. Um, and a routing visualization. So this is a pretty massive release here and uh, a lot of fun stuff to tinker with if you are going to recklessly play around with Lightning. And I guess just drop it real quick. Um, shortest story in the episode. Um, C Lightning has also finally merged into the repo um, key send and multi-path payment support. So if you want to build it yourself or in the next release, um, those features will finally be supported there, which is kind of nice to see them catching up with LND, um, which has kind of been leading the pack pretty much as far as new um, feature deployments for the most part. Whoop. That was a weird noise. Yes, yes, it was. Want to take us into the next one? Yeah, so uh, I think this is the second that I've ever... Yes, I think it's the second time I've ever been mentioned in a Coindesk article. And uh, this was published by Nick... Carter on July 13th, and it was titled Version Control Can Help the Media Win Back Reader Trust. And I was not I was not interviewed as part of the article, but I kind of knew that it was coming out because Nick had been tweeting, um, asking his followers like what he should write about, and a lot of people wanted him to write about um, using version control in journalism or media, which is something that uh, I've been working on for the past four years and uh 
I I saw a lot of you uh, sharing the fact that I had been doing that with him, and so he actually cited me, and that was really cool. But um, I also want to point out that his article in itself is really well written. Um, he basically says, uh, if a newspaper got something wrong, it had to publish a retraction because the editors couldn't go back and edit the ink on the page once published. Retractions are embarrassing, so newsrooms generally tried to get it right the first time. Today, things look very different. Data-rich advertisers like Facebook and Google now account for most ad spending online. Local journalism is feeling the squeeze as treasured smaller outlets get rolled up by private equity firms or simply go out of business. Larger publications remain, but margins are being compressed with the industry consolidating into a handful of winners. Um, as many media outlets take an interactive approach, getting feedback from their readers and editing headlines after the fact and often without any acknowledgement. Uh, and then he says that he proposes a very simple solution, which is that at the time of publication, along with the headline and putting that hash in a costly to reverse bl uh, blockchain like Bitcoin, this situation, uh, this situation is a, a specific piece of data, the article and the title in time, localizing it to an hour or so window. Um, if using Bitcoin and makes evident any subsequent changes to the content. Um, if at any point the contents of the article are altered, the hash of the text will no longer match and this text uh, and this will be trivially observable. And he actually demonstrated this himself by making a open timestamps proof of the article and title of the Coindesk piece that he wrote. Um, and so you can actually verify that timestamp. And as he writes, um, uh, this proves is that this piece of data existed at this particular time. And if the hash of the article doesn't match what was published at that particular time, then that indicates that something has changed since then. And uh, my favorite paragraph probably in the entire piece is where he says, contrary to the occasional utopian proclamations of enthusiasts, public blockchains aren't magical machines that ensure all data inserted into them is valid or true. But in this very limited context, they thrive. Timestamps on chain prove some very specific data existed as, a, as of a specific time. This suffices. We are trying to prove a specific article configure, uh, configuration existed at the time of publication and did not change thereafter, which is really great because like this is one of the, the, the very few articles that I've read on Coindesk where I literally didn't have any, uh, there was nothing that I felt like needed to be corrected. He represented this very well. Um, and like I said, he cited my work with revision control journalism um just below this part and um also linked to open timestamps and so i hope that that um that gets more use because yes more people should do this and it's not not that hard to do um but it does have you know a small impact on people's ability to just check whether a particular article has been edited after the fact mm-hmm yeah, that that was a really good piece. Like I I disagree with Nick on fuck tons of things about this space, but I feel like he gets way too much flack just because like I don't know, how do I put it? He he has a lot of very legacy views on things in this space that aren't shared by many Bitcoiners. But he is one of the few people with views like that who actually engages in good faith. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All righty. Are we ready for Shinobi ranting about a bunch of institutional stuff? Mm -hmm. All right. So first up, um, Unchained Capital, um, the guys who uh, made the, the Caravan multi-sig wallet, just announced a partnership with Tantra Labs. Um, which is actually kind of like an investment firm and pretty much um they're they're partnering with them to pretty much be like a 2fa in a multi-sig um for tantra labs um cold storage custody um because it's you know like i said it's an investing firm pretty much their business is you lend them your money and they go trade with it algorithmically um 
and give you a cut of the the returns that they make. And honestly, I think that this is I don't really think it's too intuitive unless you get into the the finance side of the space. But I think this is really a very promising potential alternative for things like BlockFi, uh, for people who actually do want to invest their Bitcoin or loan it out for an extra um, interest return on top of that. And, you know, the reason is because you, you drop money in, in a BlockFi account. Um, they're actually going to go take that and lend that out to somebody else. Um, and ultimately, it's it's still winding up on a market. Um, it's being traded. Um, that's inevitably what's happening. But with a service like BlockFi, um, you know, they're not the only counterparty who is interjecting risk into this. It's all the people that they lend that to as well. Um, whereas Cantra Labs, um, you are lending it to them, and that's it. That is the extent of your counterparty risk. Um, they themselves are actually the ones trading with that um, to try and generate uh, a return for that. And you know, clearly, this partnership with Unchained Capital, um, they are taking the the security of customers' funds very seriously, in the sense that they are now, you know, bringing this other company into the security model um, for their multi-sig storage in a way that gives them a, a, a recovery valve um, pretty much without giving Unchained the, the ability to actually ever move or control those funds unilaterally. And you know, I just think this is an interesting option given how popular things like BlockFi are and how many people apparently do want to see extra return on their Bitcoin holdings. Um, you know, this looks like something that has a lot less counterparty risk than all of those other platforms in the space. So I think, you know, again, caveats here, I am not recommending at all um, somebody use something like this. I will actually tell you, you shouldn't, um, you're an idiot. But if you insist on doing things like this, um, this might be something to look at because it's a lot less risk and a lot more people or parties involved in that counterparty risk than things like BlockFi. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I wouldn't recommend using BlockFi for several, re <laughs> for several reasons. Yeah, I know, but it's like, you know what I mean? People are going to do what they're going to do. And if you're out there looking for places you can loan out Bitcoin like that, um, you know, look into this skeptically because it's just, if, if you're going to do something, you should try to minimize the counterparty risks that you have, right? Not just who cares. Yeah. Counterparties like Palantir and the FBI and what else? Laundry list of acronyms. Mm -hmm. All righty. Did somebody say volatility? If you are not laughing right now, then you are not a degenerate trader. You have succeeded at life. I think they say that every day. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the next thing up is this, I think, is going to go in a very interesting direction. And after I spell out the facts, I am going to speculate wildly. Um, but BitMEX um, is going through a corporate restructuring right now. Um, and they have incorporated a, a holding company um, called 100X, wink, wink, uh, <laughs> which is now um, pretty much being structured as the, the top company holding HDR Global Trading, um, the BitMEX platform itself. And they're restructuring to kind of keep BitMEX itself isolated and maintained as a platform and try to expand um, into different products and services. Um, pretty much the, the gist of their blog announcing this is, um, you know, they, they're really trying to drive um, progress in terms of financial products and the types of services available or made possible because of 
technologies like Bitcoin. And yeah, um, now I'm going to speculate wildly. Um, BitMEX is one of the exchanges who is integrating Liquid. Um, and they were one of the earliest ones to start doing so. Um, now, if you look at all the types of things being built out on Liquid, um, you know, the Japanese uh, crypto garage project Settlenet for atomic OTC trading. Um, you look at a lot of the work Crypto Garage has been doing on discrete log contracts, um, which we've covered a number of times in different contexts on the show. Um, it is entirely their plan, in my opinion, to start making crypto-based derivatives for non-crypto assets. Um, there is literally no reason whatsoever um, on Liquid when you have Bitcoin and fiat stable coins there um, that you couldn't make all kinds of derivatives on conventional assets like a Facebook or Tesla stock or, you know, like, like anything. You could make artificial derivatives um, or synthetic derivatives and just trade those and follow the, the actual price of those assets. And given the nature of systems like Bitcoin, like Liquid, um, it's pretty much impossible to lock somebody out of that system and prevent them from participating in it. So if I'm right here and they really do start pushing in that direction, um, things are gonna get very interesting <laughs> in terms of Liquid and BitMEX and the kinds of pressure that they start getting from governments and regulators, because I do not think that they would be very happy about something like that. And BitMEX is one of those freewheeling um, Wild West exchanges that to this date has still not gotten fucked yet. So I think that would be a very interesting direction if that's where this goes. So you're telling me that a company is actually restructuring and calling it restructuring and they're not doing it to cover up something like a bankruptcy this time. Wow, I know. It's kind of weird how that works, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing that you can actually use a word properly and it's true. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so... This next bit of news, um, I will just call icky, but I think we knew that this was coming. Um, so Bact has announced um, a digital wallet app. And obviously it's going to be completely custodial. Um, but yeah. Um, this is a, a hodgepodge of all the things smashed in together. Um, it's set up to watch your crypto portfolio um, purchase through them. Um, it's actually also set up for um, loyalty points programs um, for different corporations and redeeming those. Um, trading, so the ability to buy and sell crypto in the app itself. Um, as well as cash payments um, that you can, so pretty much like a, a backed spin on Cash App or Venmo or what have you. And um, they're planning on linking a debit card to this as well. Um, and yeah, um, you know, we knew this was coming. Um, aside from the futures um, products and all of the finance side of this, um, right when they announced the, the company, they were talking about payments. Um, they partnered or had support from Starbucks and Microsoft um, looking down the road for retail use of crypto and such. And, you know, I've gone into all the, the details about how those things synergize with the, the futures contracts and their finance products. But yeah, um, this, this is kind of icky. Um, this is going far beyond the scope of just a, a centralized payment layer for Bitcoin. Um, this is trying to become the little walled garden that manages every aspect of your, your financial life, your investments, your payments, your savings, even your, your game tokens and, and 
loyalty points from Starbucks. And it's kind of icky. <laughs> like, the, the, this was something I was looking at and just kind of wondering how they would play this. You know, I was, I was honestly on the fence considering, like, whether I would use this product um, when they eventually launched it based on what it did and how it worked. And, yeah, looking at all of this, um, I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, loyalty programs are basically like, thanks for sticking around and thanks for identifying yourself to us and thanks for giving us a bunch of data about what you do. Here's some, here's some treats. Yeah, it, it always weirds Good me doggy. out when I'm in line at a 7-Eleven and somebody uses their stupid like points app and gets it scanned when they're buying shit. It's like, you, you do realize now that you are giving 7-Eleven a gigantic data set on every little thing that you buy and when and how you pay for it um, for your activity dealing with that business period. And it's for what, a free coffee or whatever coupon they give you? Like, no, <laughs> that's moronic. Who's a good doggy? Who's a good doggy who came back when we called? Oh, boy. I mean, hey, implement some anonymous uh, credential system and maybe I'll actually consider it, but nope. <laughs> mm -hmm. All righty, though. You want to wanna warm up the punching bag this week? Yeah, so as will be surprising to no one, um, in our last episode, 228, I had talked about Coinbase's new contract with the U.S. Secret Service via a subscription to their rebranded Coinbase Analytics platform, which was formerly Neutrino, which was formerly Hacking Team Upper Management. And furthermore, back in episode 223, I talked about the potential contracts that they were seeking with also the IRS and the DEA for non-Americans, the DEA is the Drug Enforcement Administration. And well, we have since found out that the potential contract with the IRS has now been actualized as of July 14th, because a subscription purchase order uh, from the IRS has since been published and it was signed on July 14th. The action obligation value, which is basically the money that they, the IRS is, you know, contracted and expecting to pay is $124,950. And the total contract value, which is the potential amount that they could pay um, for, you know, if, if everything works and they continue to use it during the time period given, uh, the total contract value is $237,000. Um, and so we don't have any more information about what the IRS is going to use it for, but the attached document for the contract request that was originally put up when this potential contract was noticed was that the cyber crimes unit of their criminal investigation division was seeking, quote, analysis and tracking of cryptocurrency flows across multiple blockchains that criminals are currently using. Um, there was a whole a whole document attached to that Um not too much specific information. The DEA one was definitely, I think, I think the DEA one had more information. But yeah, so now the IRS one has happened and the Secret Service one has happened. Yay! Is this a bootlicker? I don't know. I mean... It's it's just, you know, it's kind of interesting because there there's this whole narrative that Coinbase has put out over the years saying, like, we fought for our users and we pr protected their privacy and we prevented, you know, we, we lessened the amount of data that we gave to the RS. And it's like, OK, but now now you're taking tax money to give them a blockchain surveillance tool that was built by a hacking team. I, I, I see a contradiction there. I don't know, know exactly where it is, but it's there. Oh, the whole part where they, they don't actually give a fuck about user privacy when they can make money off of it? 
Yeah, you use Monero and use Zcash, but don't turn on don't don't turn on the shielded transaction part because it's actually you know you're not supposed to do that. And also, we don't list Monero, so sorry. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're gonna have this punching bag for quite a long time to come. Mm-hmm. What, what else is uh, going on with the IRS, though? Oh, yeah. So if anyone is feeling angry, um, I mean, this isn't a class action lawsuit. Maybe he would consider having other people join on. But um, Jim Harper, who is uh, currently a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and was formerly a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, announced on, I think it was the, I don't remember what day he announced this. It was in the last week or so. Um, he announced that, or last week sometime, uh, he said that he would be, quote, suing the IRS today for violation of my Fourth Amendment and due process rights. Um, and he's the author, uh, I mean, he has quite quite a substantial resume. I think he, uh, I don't remember the exact name of the panel, but he was like a co-founder of a department, uh, Department of Defense? I don't know. He he basically made some kind of committee for like data protection, um, a, like an advisory committee to the U.S. government about data protection. Uh, he's also I don't know if he's currently acting as a lawyer. It doesn't sound like that. But at one point he uh, he well he says he's a he was trained as a lawyer. I don't know if he ever actually acted as a lawyer recently. But um, he's the author of a book called Identity Crisis: How Identification Is Overused and Misunderstood, published in two thousand six. And so in his thread um, that he posted on Twitter announcing this, he said, um, I was a recipient of a warning letter sent to cryptocurrency users last summer suggesting that they hadn't paid their taxes. I have. We believe the IRS's acquisition of my private financial information was contrary to law. They may have acquired it through a summons issued to the crypto platform Coinbase. We don't know that for sure but a defective process that denied me the opportunity to contest the seizure of my, it was a defective process that um, denied me the opportunity to contest the seizure of my data. I'll be seeking destruction of the records in the IRS's control. A win would allow all recipients of the letter to seek the same. Uh, This suit is an effort to make the law match up with our times. When the fourth amendment was adopted, people kept financial information on paper within the home. Now the same information was, sides on the servers of servitors who are pledged to maintain it in confidence. The law doesn't recognize that. Um, and I'll explain a bit more of that. There was recently a case in the, I think it was the Western District of Texas. It was somewhere in Texas there. Um, I think I might've even mentioned it on the show before. Um, but basically there was a defendant in Texas who argued that he had a uh, privacy interest in not only his Bitcoin tra- transactions, but also his Coinbase records. And the the circuit judges in that case decided that he didn't because they determined that Coinbase records were similar enough to bank records and bank records don't currently have any, if, if very much if any, Fourth Amendment protections. And therefore they they did not have to get a warrant to and inform him of the fact that they were accessing that information. And then they said in combination with the fact that Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain is public, then they don't also don't need a warrant to access that information. And then you combine them and voila, you get a, uh, you get a lot of information about a person's financial history. So it's going to be interesting. Obviously that was a circuit court in Texas. I don't know how, widely that particular determination is held by other courts um but i assume it probably is if not in practice at least in principle so it's going to be interesting to see someone challenge this and maybe if other people also have received the same letter maybe you should consider joining up with him or something yeah uh I think interest is a little bit of an undersell on this. Like if this actually resolves itself in in a positive way, like this could be a big win in terms of, you know, privacy in this space when you interact with custodial services and, and such like that, like, 
you know, and, and this it's not even just Bitcoin or crypto. Like it, this is something that really does need to get adjusted in terms of digital information, period. And courts have just refused to do so for the most part for decades. Yeah, and this is going to be especially interesting also in light of the class action lawsuit against Plaid, which I think, yeah, I also talked about them last, in the last episode, um, because that case involves so much more information because potentially if you have a person who is using a lot of these payment apps, if they're using Coinbase and Stripe and Venmo or like a, a selection of them, um, a lot of them use the Plaid bank account integration feature. And so that means that as whatever information base has about you would pale in comparison to what Plaid has because Plaid can not only see into your bank account and scrapes a lot of that information, but they will create a, I, I assume they're creating profiles of you where they're, they're combining the data from your Coinbase app and your Venmo app and your Stripe app and your Cash app, blah, 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 list goes on. So they basically can have a window into all of your financial activity, which is, that's that's scary because Plaid is also a third party and Plaid is also acting on the basis that you have consented to this. And so it would not surprise me if like, you know, why the, why the hell is the IRS going after Coinbase? They should go after, they should go and ask Plaid for this information because Plaid has way more than, than Coinbase or any of these individual apps will have. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, right. um, one last detail. Um, he mentioned that he was going to be represented by Caleb Kruckenberg and the New Civil Liberties Alliance, or NCLA, which is a, a nonpartisan, non civil rights group founded by prominent legalist Philip Hamburger to protect constitutional freedoms from violations by what they can administrative state. So, a state that imposes itself too much on people. So, that's interesting. I mean, I think in general, it's interesting to have a lawyer uh, or at least a train as someone who trained as a lawyer to be the one suing the IRS instead of an average Joe. Mm -hmm. All right, though, we ready for some awesome news. What is awesome? So um, Paradigm, a crypto investment firm, they pretty much invest in um different crypto assets and companies in this space has announced that they are going to be funding um, Bitcoin developer Anthony Towns. Um, this is awesome on so many levels. Um, mostly though, it's the source of the funding and why things are playing out this way. Um, so like Anthony lately, he's been doing a lot of work um, on lightning and dropping a, a lot of neat ideas in that regard. He's also been participating in the Schnorr and Taproot upgrades and um, he's been pretty active on the, the Signet um, functionality, like pretty much trying to replace um, proof of work with keys um, to make testnet more reliable. Um, but they're going to be paying him a salary. Um, to work on Bitcoin with complete freedom to work on whatever he wants. And the really interesting part here is Paradigm actually, um, you know, reached out to um, people at Zappo and Square Crypto and Chaincode um, to kind of figure out how they should approach, um, you know, funding somebody in this space developing. And this is just fucking awesome. Because is not even like a year ago, I believe you you had the um, the B Foundation, um, that whole fiasco with a lot of figures in this space um, trying to put that together and arguing for the need to have a, a nonprofit organization like that to fund development. And I had a lot of problems with that because of just the way that those incentives would play out with a single core group like that. Um, just inevitably becoming a gatekeeper um, as far as funding development because you create that organization 
um, companies like Paradigm or Zappo, will, they'll just throw money at that instead of spending the time and effort to decide what to fund themselves. And that eventually de facto makes that organization um, kind of a choke point in terms of what gets funded or not. And, you know, I think we've seen over the last year, like Square Crypto being set up, um, now Paradigm actually with um, their advice, funding a developer independently. Like we've seen the Human Rights Foundation um, assign grants for Bitcoin development. Like th there was no need for a single organization like that. Um, every individual company or group out there that has an incentive to do so, um, they're going to do it. And I think the last year or so has shown that with all of these different independent groups um, stepping up and funding development in one way or another. So this is just an awesome thing to see continue. Like that this company, um, they're just an investment firm. Um, they've never done anything like this in this space before. And just as people holding and trading assets in this space, um, they decided to step up and do this. So I think it's going to be awesome. And we are probably going to see a rapid acceleration of this type of stuff. Kind of a uh, tangential question, but every the since the first time I saw Paradigm's company name, I've been curious as to why they didn't spell their name Paradigm as in a you know dime and nickel, like they're dealing with crypto assets, and I feel like they missed out on an opportunity to include a financial word in their name. <laughs> Wrecked. Just, just a suggestion. It's just something I think about every time I see their company name. That would probably catch in people's mind a lot more. <laughs> Especially given that, like, the naming schemes in this space can get really crazy. So you know, I feel like that wouldn't have been too crazy of a of a rewrite. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, so this is actually uh, pretty cool. Um, I think you you actually mentioned this um, offhand a few episodes ago, and I finally had the time to dig into it. But there is a bit proposal from Dmitry Petikov, um, probably butchered his last name, um, for um, a template for describing um, derivation paths. And they actually mention um, walletrecovery.org um, in the BIP <laughs> as a, an, an illustration Yay. of how bad this problem is, um, that something like yes. this should probably be done. Very, very bad. But it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much just like a, a simple semantic um, for describing um, different derivation paths with the goal of creating kind of a universal thing that wallets could implement to just very quickly um, describe derivation paths that aren't supported by default. Um, and it's pretty much um, just, it's literally just like the notation you would see for, um, you know, a derivation path, um, M slash index number, index number, slash index number, slash index number, but a semantic for defining ranges in it. So the idea being that slash M, like you would have 44, 49, 84, um, if I'm remembering correctly for legacy addresses, pay to script hash, um, and then native um, segwit addresses. And you know, you would pretty much just have a bracket and separate those by commas. And that would inform the wallet, check all of these. And then going down from there, um, you can also define ranges. So down um, the path, like zero to 50,000. And the wallet would only consider valid um, that range down that path between zero to 50,000. And there's also a neat little logic um, where you can have a partial path with the idea being that um, let's say, you know, you have M slash um, 84. That strictly speaking would be a complete path. And then you could have 
partial paths um, after that that vary and have logic to kind of compose or like plug and play um, with partial paths to construct a full path. But the, the general idea being like if, if this was actually adopted, wallets could just have the standard, um, you know, derivation scheme described with this template that a normal wallet uses, um, but also, um, you know, be able to very quickly import something from another wallet that uses some screwy custom derivation path. Um, just spit out the template and plug that into your other wallet and not have that nightmare inconsistency that we have right now where anything not doing the core standard um well let's see which wallet i can get these coins on um so th this i hope actually gets some uh, attention and some momentum behind it because this would this would solve such a massive pain point for a lot of users if you know, this was specced out and formalized as a BIP and wallets could actually start integrating this. Yes, I agree. Alrighty. I guess uh, we can go out on a funny note here. Um, sadly, I was not able to actually get a hold of anybody um, who spoke Mandarin or read Mandarin and Dubby has not directly translated. Um, the letter that this is citing yet um so we might bring this back up again next week but in the bitmain drama um jihan has now established a um new company um new um factory location and um pretty much um is attempting to um you know reestablish relationships with suppliers um, so Bitmain has quite literally forked now <laughs> with McCree having the, uh, the core company in Beijing, um, the factory and warehouse in, um, Shenzhen and the bank accounts associated with that, as well as, um, a good relationship with suppliers apparently. Um, and Jihan has now forked off and established his own, um, supply chain, his own warehouse and own corporate entity um in hong kong and um yes there are now actually um pretty much all the way down the corporate stack if if jihan can you know actually um recreate relationships with suppliers um there are two bitmains bitmain itself has literally hard forked fork your mother if you want fork So yeah, I, I really have nothing um, else to add except uh, more laughter. <laughs> so I guess that's uh, final thoughts time for the day. I am trying to think of something. Do, 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 do. Okay, I, I found something. So I was, um, over the weekend, and I was actually looking for a, uh, I was looking for the place to, uh, I was looking for the location on the internets where um, the pure browser that comes with pure OS that Purism produces is downloadable. And Instead, as the first result that came up, I instead got something called Pure Browser, the world's first Christian web browser. Pure Browser automatically filters out over 300 impure words and blocks over 1.9 million impure sites that may cause impure thoughts. Yes, I read that. That is actually on their website. And it turns out it's based on DuckDuckGo. So that's just something very funny that I came across that sounds so <laughs> ridiculous. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, um, because someone, someone reminded me of it, um, below the tweet that I uh, shared this out on, there was also something called Temple OS. And, um, if you don't know what Temple OS is, it was made by this dude who claimed that he had been called upon by God to write a Christian operating system. And, 
uh, I think it was, cre it, it looks like it was built in the 90s, but it was launched in, I think, 2005, and then he kind of revamped it twice, uh, I think the last time being in 2017, and then he died in, like, a car crash in 2018, so cursed browser or curse search engine slash web browser cursed operating system if you are looking for weird um christian themed uh, <laughs> stuff the normies are finding terry i i also <laughs> i also believe that uh when he when he revamped temple os in 2013 uh, the website said something about how god's temple is finished and now he's going to kill the cia or something like that so have fun with that <laughs> yeah terry terry davis is the greatest meme on the internet but before before you, you threw me bringing him up though uh that that browser made me think of this hilarious meme that's just like a shot of somebody's hands climbing up a ladder into the sky and just you can't climb to heaven with your hands full of penis <laughs> okay <laughs> um oh, the the other final thought that is also related to code is that um i think this was this was july 16th um i was just doing some github things and a new badge appeared on my profile that said I was an Arctic Vault contributor. I had no idea what that meant, and I was a bit scared that <laughs> I, I had done something <laughs> that I was not aware of. Um, but it turns out that the GitHub Arctic Cold Vault, vault um, is apparently a data repository that is it's a bit like with it somewhere close to or within the arctic circle i think on their website it says that it's in an it's in a decommissioned coal mine in the svalbard archipelago close to the north pole closer to the north pole than the arctic circle okay so basically github and the internet archive and i also think the heritage foundation i don't there's a couple of organizations but they've basically set up some kind of vault very in a very cold place and as of february 2020 if you owned or contributed to a repository that was public um that repository has now been backed up in this vault in my case i haven't really done too much code stuff on github so basically instead my journalism has now been put in cold storage which i found quite funny yeah, that was actually pretty cool. That's uh, it looks pretty much like the full software stack necessary to recover technology from an apocalypse. Yes, I believe the website says that they are building it to survive a thousand years, or something like that. So all of your uh, all of your little get commit mistakes that you've made are going to be immortalized for a thousand years <laughs> into the future. Oh my God. I wonder if all of Cobra's stupidity is in there. <laughs> all my spelling mistakes. Oh, man. My very, very stupid spelling mistakes. Me trying to get an icon to work. <laughs> also, yeah, I just took a picture of my screen for no reason. <laughs> because I clicked the wrong button. Boom! Mortalized. Well, I mean, I don't know. I really don't have any final thought um, beyond just I really wish that people in this space would act more like adults. Um, yeah. But I think that... I think we need a um, spaghetti monster OS, please. I need an adult. You have been called upon, called upon by the spaghetti monster to create an OS dedicated to his noodliness. If you meme it, they will build it. But yeah, you know, on that note, uh, adios punks. Uh, Shinobi is going to now consider taking a nap. Toodles. <laughs> Was there, was there that sang a 
Yeah, you need to have food to yet. Yeah, you see it. Yeah, I see it.